I'm sure more people join as we get started. But yeah, I mean, do, do you want me to like do an intro real quick? I mean, like I can introduce everybody and like right sure, Dan. sure. Okay, well, what's up, everyone? You know, all like twelve of y'all. You know, thanks for showing up. Welcome. Today. Uh, yes, I know. I know it's midterm week. Everyone's suffering, but hopefully this provides a pretty fun relaxation from the grind. So today we have our guest speaker, the legendary Danok One, or aka like the world's greatest malware historian. And a quick little summary, if you guys haven't heard of him, uh, he runs a pretty awesome YouTube channel where he makes all these videos about computer malware. So if you want to see a particular like war of Trojan in action, chances are you can probably find it on Dan's channel. And actually, another fun fact, if you all are familiar with Trojans, the memes, I think that's how you pronounce it, M-E-M-Z memes virus, was actually a viewer made Trojan for Danok 1. So definitely, if you want to see cool stuff like that, subscribe to his channel to see some really cool uh, malware and old internet worms in action. Actually, for my final ECS 3390 project, I did mine on the I Love You Worm, and like half of that was just basically from Dan's videos. I got 100 on that. So thanks, Dan, for the GPA. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I finally got my uh, my thanks for that. Yeah, I definitely put you in the credits. I don't think my professor <laughs> wrote that. I, I put in your put your name on there for sure. So yeah, Dan has very generously agreed to take time out of his busy schedule to swing by here, showcase us some cool stuff he's been working on, and then after that demonstration, we'll host like an AMA. So at that point, you know, feel free to unmute your mic, ask him literally anything you want. But yeah, thanks again for coming, Dan. Uh, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Kevin. Uh, yeah. So like Kevin said, my YouTube channel has been running for over. 12 years now, since late 2008. Um, started that in high school and continued it while I was in college. And I went to UTD, graduated with my BA in criminology in 2013, and my MS in GIS in 2015. And here we are, still doing the same old YouTube thing this entire time. And I have a quick, just sort of demo of some various pieces of malware that I, I've made videos on for my channel, but it's been many years. So I guess right off the bat, we can start with Love Letter, which Kevin was just mentioning doing his final project on. So Love Letter was a worm that emerged May 4th, 2000, written in Visual Basic Script, so as you can see, very advanced. I'm sure many of you have never seen anything close to the level of skill required to write this particular worm, especially in this Discord. So don't don't be intimidated, please. But the gist of it was you run it. I don't have Outlook on here, but you run it and it um, searches your hard drive. This is my cool message box. It overwrites VBS scripts with itself, replaces, as you can see now, it's been replaced, replaces various other files, MP3s. Uh, I can't remember exactly what else that it Replaces. It had a routine here to go out to the internet and download a keylogger, and then it would mass mail itself to your contacts on Outlook, saying, uh, "Kindly check the attached love letter coming from me with a copy of the VBS script." And Windows 98 by default. And I'm pretty sure it's still the default on Windows 10. Hides known file extensions. So what love letter did was end with a dot text and then a dot vbs but since windows 98 knows that you know what vbs is it hides it so it looks like an ordinary text file so you wound up with millions of people all over the, all over the globe running this worm getting infected taking down corporate networks uh generally causing a massive headache for it admins everywhere so that is the gist of love letter uh, I mentioned in the uh, chat channel for stream uh, guest commentators that I set this up in about 15 minutes prior to this presentation. So please forgive my hastiness and uh, slapdash descriptions of anything that's going on here. Uh, I just picked a couple cool ones that I really like, like um, Smash is neat. So that activates July 14th. Let us change the date. I am not well versed in VirtualBox, but it's free and it runs on Windows 10. So hopefully it maintains my date setting. Yeah, all right, so let's run Smash. So this infects Windows executable files. And when you run an executable file that's been infected on July 14th, you see a custom blue screen of death tells you your computer has been infected by a virus and ends with, seems like your bad dream comes true. 
So this sounds like something stupid you'd see in a mid-90s hacker movie, but it's actually a real virus that was never very widespread, but it was something you could pick up and infect yourself with. So you press any key to continue, and it reboots. And it's supposed to say formatting and format the drive. Hey, look, it worked. This almost never works. Every time I've ever looked at this virus, it never does the formatting routine. But here, it, it seems to have worked. So it does indeed format your hard drive. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of bad if you need your data or anything like that. So let me shut this down and restore from a snapshot. Just restore it. Can I run it? Start. Hopefully that restored. Like I said, I'm not the best at VirtualBox. Here we go. We'll take a look at um, a couple more. So Black Death. Oh, I don't have Word on here. Okay, this is actually a macro virus. So be aware anytime you're uh, scoping for threats out there in the cybersecurity world, macros have a lot of hidden capabilities that you may not expect. Black Death activates on Friday the 13th when you open an infected Word document. It infects all the Word documents you can find on your machine. And when you open those, it will actually delete a bunch of critical files out of the Windows directory and then tells you your computer has been basically messed up by the Black Death virus. And you're pretty much screwed at that point, all from a Word document. So let's see here. Last one I'll take a look at is called OpaServe. So this is a network worm, it requires no user intervention to spread. Operated mainly on Windows 95 and 98. It searched for random IP addresses, and when it found one, it would attempt to see if it could use a bunch of passwords to break into the system and copy itself over. In Windows 95, it exploited a bug that allowed it to suggest the first character of the password to the receiving machine, which Windows then accepted as the verified password and opened up to the worm, which would then spread to that machine. So if you didn't patch your machine, you were pretty much open to this infection if OpaServe randomly landed on your IP address. Now, I think we get this one to activate by deleting its registry key. So let's see. So we go into current version run, and it's all the Windows malware likes to do, or at least liked to do back in the day. Not entirely sure what the uh, current threat model is for running malware these days. But let's see. I believe it is MPREXE. If we delete this key, OpaServe is sitting here monitoring for anybody trying to mess with it. And uh, it, there it goes, it rebooted. And it pops up with this screen. I don't think it's going to show up if we're only going to... Oh, there it is. So it tells you your uh, illegal Microsoft Windows license is detected and you are in violation of the DMCA. Your license has been revoked. And it prevent, presents this uh, pretty official-looking BSA uh, script, I guess, telling you not to pirate Windows. But this is all illegitimate. When you see this message, it really messes up the file allocation table for the drive. When you look at the drive under uh, FDisk in MS-DOS, you see about four partitions one of which having negative one megabytes in size, another two each taking up about 590% of the drive space. So your data is pretty much gone. And when you're talking about malware from this era, having backups usually meant you were backing up onto a big stack of floppy disks and usually only the stuff you most wanted to keep. If you were really, really fancy, you might've had a tape drive you know, the high-speed, high-capacity tape drives of several gigabytes, but that was very few and far between in households of the era. I'm going to wrap up my presentation here. There's really not much I can show you here that I don't already do on my YouTube channel. If you want to see more of stuff like this, go ahead and check that out. I'm here in this Discord, and you can ping me whenever, and I answer whenever I can. So I think we will leave off there. 
And if you have any questions about viruses, malware, my channel, UTD, whatever, just let me know. Well, I guess I better end it with the, um, the video line, right? So thank you very much for watching. Take care. There we go. That was awesome. That was amazing. All right. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Uh, how are these questions going to work? Um, so I guess if you have a question, just unmute yourself and start talking. And uh, if yeah, we'll just see the louder voice gets to ask the question first. That's Good right. Luck. Whoever mutes everybody else's mic through the sheer power of their voice will be answered. Oh, seriously. No questions. It doesn't have to be malware related. Anybody got like a UTD question? Like, I have a UTD. question for all you UTD nerds. So I started attending UTD in the summer of 2009. I graduated high school on a Saturday. I moved the next Sunday, the next day, and started classes that Monday right after that. So in a span of two days, I graduated and started college at UTD. I attended the Eric Johnson summer program that summer before freshman year, which was fun. But as soon as we moved in, construction began on the campus beautification project. And that lasted the entire time through my entire BA and my MS and was still ongoing by the time I left in 2015. Is construction still happening? Because I need to know. Uh, phase first, need three to of beautification is still going. And what yes. Going? Lots of construction is still happening. Okay, Mark. I feel better that it didn't end immediately after I graduated. Wow. So you were there for the start of the dorms? Yes. So we were in apartments right across from where they were building the first dorm building. Um, I guess right across the street from University Village. When you go down Drive L, I think it is. I can't remember. It's been been a few years. North of the apartments, yeah. Yeah. So Loop Road Southwest. Yes. So when we started attending, they had just broken ground on that. So we had fun being fresh, new faced college students on their own for the first time in these apartment buildings, being woken up at six in the morning every morning by heavy construction equipment. It was fun. I also lived in those apartments, the apartments on the far north, uh, northeast corner, uh, for three years, and they they were still doing construction on that utility plant there. That figures. And on the new science building that's now across from it, where the art barn was. Did they take down the art barn? Yep. Oh no, rip! Okay, and they took down that. Uh, oh, Clark. W. And that's now ECS West. Huh. Okay. I heard that they were going to expand on the north side of campus to make that because there's like some like outside apartments in north side. I heard they were going to add some buildings north of that and make north side like kind of like a base for like the north side of campus. Interesting. Everything is within DFW airspace here. Lucky punks. So it sounds to me like the drones need to be running over the cricket field. Yeah. <laughs> Cannot confirm that. Yeah. I got I a understand. boring question. Shoot. I got a I boring like question questions. for you, Dan. Uh, did you ever consider going to computer science? Uh, I was actually in electrical engineering for oh, that's two years. Yeah, that murdered me. 
because I am not good at calculus. That was the main barrier to my continuing in in EE. I made it through the first calculus course. You know, I did it the uh, slower way, where you take three semesters of progressively more difficult calculus classes. And I made it through the first two, but the second one only just barely, and I decided that was not going to happen again. And so I switched majors to criminology, which was significantly easier. So if any of you are really struggling with cybersecurity, I recommend criminology. You don't have many career prospects, but damn if it's not an easy degree. Do you actually practice your major of criminology? I do not. I have not used it a day in my life. But <laughs> criminology Classic. did lead me to my master's. So my last semester of criminology, there was a GIS professor who came around and said, hey, have any of you thought about mapping crime with GIS? And I said, what the hell is GIS? So it is geospatial information sciences. So basically, you know, data applied mapping, data analysis with a cartography component to it. So I decided to try getting my master's in that and wound up liking it a lot. And so now that is what I do. I applied to a few different police stations as you know, a criminal analyst and stuff like that, but never got the job. My favorite being Carrollton Police Station, where I interviewed, and the, uh, the police sergeant, whoever it was who was hiring, called me later that week. He said, we really liked what you got. You know, we're excited by your, your UTD projects that you're doing, but we just found somebody from this neighboring city doing the exact thing we're looking for, and he wants to come work here, so sorry. So that was about as close as I ever got to, to applying criminology to anything for money. I only know two people at UTD and GIS, and they're both called Chris. How many Chris's did you know in GIS? That's a great you know, question. Right there. That is a good question. How many Chris's did I know? I knew a couple. Not well, but I knew, knew them. Surprisingly, there's nobody in my work group named Chris, so maybe it's a maybe it's a more recent thing. You know Chris Chike, right? I, I know of him. I've spoken to him once. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I got to bug him a big deal for a uh, for a selfie, but I don't it's... I don't think he's in GIS. No, I don't think so either. But he is in software engineering. He is. Yes, freshman year of college, there was this guy who always rode around on a unicycle with a top hat. And, you know, I figured there had to be a story behind that, even if it was something as simple as I am now in college and I'm going to be as weird as I feel like being at the moment. But I never did run into them at a point where I could stop and be like, can you get off your unicycle for a moment and just talk to me? Always. He was going for it. Back in yeah, my day, there was a guy with a cowboy hat and a skateboard. Ripstick. Still... Oh, yeah, it was a ripstick. We did have a couple people on ripsticks, too. But they did not stand out as much as Unicycle Guy. Is he... Did you I mean, meet... I'll... Did you meet the great man, Ross Ulbricht, himself? No. Didn't he graduate like 2006? Sad. <laughs> Ooh. 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 Was... Maybe there's a plaque. <laughs> the Silk Road lived here. Was UTD always as devoid of a social life uh, as it is now? 
this looks like a social life to me if I've ever seen one. It's true. Yeah, sure. I think this is about the most active I've ever seen any any UTD related thing. Um, freshman year, we had quite a few get-togethers, just various events on campus, and I'm pretty sure that ninety percent of the turnout was due to the fact that they offered pizza. If they didn't offer free food, I don't think anybody would have come. CSG usually has pizza. All right, I will come to your next meeting when when there's pizza again. What do you do mostly like nowadays? Uh, work. A lot of work. Like, what kind of work? So I work in telecom. So my job consists of a lot of data analysis. We're on the documentation side of things. So our go our goal is to make sure the information we have is accurate and stuff on our map is in the right spot and that the stuff behind the map is right. So if we have, you know, a, a cable, a fiber optic cable that runs down the street, we want to know that it actually runs down this street. And furthermore, we need to make sure it runs on the right side of the street that it actually is built on. So we have a couple hundred uh, vendors, contractors working with us that are just combing through our millions and millions of piles of crap, you know, reading as built, scanning through, finding out what it's supposed to be, and updating it in our system. So my job is to automate a lot of that and try to make it as easy for them as possible to update what we need to update. And that is my job. Why did you start your YouTube channel originally? So I started YouTube because I stumbled across a few pieces of malware, namely a worm called Happy99 and the Love Letter Worm, and I had been reading about viruses and malware for about four years prior to that and thought they were really neat, but had never seen them in person. I had been reading for several years just, you know, virus descriptions. Antivirus sites at the time had pages and pages of alphabetically sorted virus descriptions. So you click on a letter and just start reading through names, you know, love letter, and then all these other L viruses and worms. Just real nerd crap. It was great. I really liked that, but I'd never seen it until I stumbled across those files. And so I had an old computer that my family didn't care about anymore. So I just fired it up and decided, why can't I just put this malware on there and try it? So I did. And it worked. I was like, that's really cool. You know, YouTube was relatively new at the time. It was less than three years old. And... Prior to that, I had posted some really terribly recorded Guitar Hero videos for anybody that still remembers Guitar Hero. And I decided maybe I'll make a video on this because they were, there were almost nothing out there about viruses or malware other than some stupid, you know, batch script stuff and general fake scary virus OMG. So... I decided to record actual real malware just because I liked it. And I had a, two or three videos up for about two or three months. And one day I got an email saying that somebody had subscribed to my channel. And I had no idea what the hell a subscriber was. I figured YouTube was just a place you put videos up and people can watch them. I thought views were the goal, but no, that's what started all. I was like, whoa, people might actually want to see this. So I found more malware, started recording more malware. If you've ever watched my really early videos, they're really terrible. They're me with a freehand camera shaking it all over. And then when a message box pops up, I cram the camera into the screen and hopefully you can read it. And of course, YouTube was in you know, 360p at that time. So all in all, just a really terrible experience. But it started off the whole thing. And now here we are. 
in 2021, still making videos on old computers with old viruses. And more, more people seem to like it now. So that's where we are. That's how we began. That's pretty much how I found your channel in the first place. I was reading about them, and I think it was specifically the You Are an Idiot was the first video of yours that I came across. I'm not surprised. That is my most viewed. That seems to be, you know, an entity in and of itself. Like, I'll make new videos from time to time, and You Are an Idiot just eclipses all of them in views, even with brand new videos, even having almost 290,000 people subscribed. You Are an Idiot just holds its own across every other video I ever make and just steamrolls them. It's pretty I mean, funny. It's a legendary piece of work. It is. It is. And what's funny is that video was almost never recorded. I remembered that animation from Albino Black Sheep, if, if, if any of you remember that. It was a Flash video repository website. And it just had that You Are an Idiot song on a loop forever. And I had heard that there was a Trojanized version that, you know, spammed Windows, but I never really cared about it too much. But there were always people asking, could you make a video on You Are an Idiot? You Are an Idiot is the most destructive virus in the world. Can you make a video on it? So I made this video just to, you know, shut them up. I was like, if you watch that video and really listen, you can hear the, you know, sarcasm that just drips from my voice. You know, this really dangerous malware, you know, finally doing this so you can stop asking me about it. I figured this was going to be a one and done, you know, this video is done. People will watch it and then they'll finally stop bugging me about it. But no, it is now the most viewed video on my channel. So I guess I'm glad I made a video on it, but damn. Oh, I know I was the idiot. We are all idiots on this blessed day. Wow. That was Maybe the internet historian? Not the internet historian, but a few internet historians. I actually got paid to fly out to San Francisco in 2015 and give a talk at this exhibit put on by Swissnex, which is like this art slash research arm of the Swiss government. And they wanted to do a cyber virus art exhibit where they had a whole bunch of machines lining this room, each with a different virus on them. So people could come up and they had instructions on the screen. Here's what you do to run this virus. And they'd run it. It would do the thing and they could move to the next one and run that and do the thing. So they invited me out. I gave the, the keynote talk to that, which was crazy to me because the other speakers included a guy who's worked for Symantec as a malware analyst since like 1991 and one of the guys who founded the electronic freedom foundation or frontier or eff whatever it stands for so it was nuts that they picked me to, to you know to keynote the whole thing but that was a lot of fun there's been a few other places there's a malware museum online on archive.org where you can spin up a virtual machine that runs some of these old pieces of malware I got to oh, yeah, I've, a seen, bit that. That. I've so, seen that. Yeah. I've helped a bit with that. There's been a few others, but there's not a huge you know, presence that demands the archival of all this old malware. So I'm glad some people are at least aware of it and looking at keeping it around. Are you familiar with, what is it, uh, VX Underground? They have a GitHub repo with some archived old malware stuff and some slightly newer stuff, too. Yeah, I, I, I think I follow them on Twitter. I think that's the one that has a Twitter account, anyway. Um, I've looked at some of their stuff, not extensively, but I do know of it. Okay. Does any anybody questions? have? Yeah. yeah. Anybody have any questions? Um, I guess I'll go next. So let's hear. It. 
Okay, all right. Uh, so <laughs> considering how successful YouTube is now, why um, continue working? I know it's a weird question, but I mean, so, it's so you have why keep doing my day job? Yeah, yeah, basically. Well, I don't make that much money on YouTube, actually. Definitely not enough to support myself. If you average it out, it's like way, way, way below working for minimum wage. I started making money from ads on YouTube when they launched the partnership program in 2010, I want to say. I applied when I had a thousand subscribers and they accepted me for some weird reason. And so I started then. And the amount that I made then increased every month for about a year until it reached this plateau. And for whatever reason, that number has been the average since. So for you know, 10 some odd years now, it has not really gone up or down much at all. There have been some cases where I had posted my uh, love letter video on one of the anniversaries on Reddit, and it wound up hitting number two on um, all. So it's number two on Reddit. It had some like 30 something thousand upvotes. I gained, I want to say, over 10,000 subscribers in a day from it when I only had, you know, 70,000 at the time. So it was a huge number, over a million views that day. And I think from all of that, for the month, I made, you know, as much as I make now working in you know, two weeks. So it's never been a huge windfall. I get sponsorship requests from various no-name Chinese VPNs all the time, but I'm not willing to compromise my, you know, my morals and ethics saying, use this generic VPN none of you have ever heard of. Play Raid Shadow Legends. Because nobody comes to my videos caring about any of that crap. And I just don't want to get paid for it just to say, you know, give me money. Exactly. Exactly. Any current malware developments that you follow closely? I want to say... I don't know what I want to say. What do I want to say? I'm interested to see what happens with this uh, Microsoft Exchange server stuff. I started reading all the um, fallout coming from that a few days ago and decided that would be as good a time as ever to back up all the scripts I've wrote, written for work and stick them on a drive far away from my work laptop so that when the ransomware inevitably hits, I won't get all my crap encrypted. I'm interested to see uh, what keeps going with that. What's the worst bit of malware that you've actually ever got yourself? The worst one I've gotten myself, well, I've only ever been infected, I want to say twice. Unintentionally, that is. Um, the first was Sasser in 2004, which was a network worm that spread to vulnerable PCs and used a uh, Windows service via an exploit. It would get into your machine and begin scanning for more machines to infect. The side effect of that was it crashed the Windows service that it exploited, which would make the computer reboot. So you'd see this prompt saying this computer is shutting down, and it would give you a little countdown timer and for one minute, and it would reboot, come back up, the worm would run itself, start scanning for more computers, crash the service, rinse and repeat. So your computer's rebooting over and over and over, and that was my first real exposure to malware in general was figuring out how to stop it from rebooting and removing the worm. Second time was a rogue antivirus that came bundled with a rootkit in 2007. So if you remember all the uh, antiviruses that used to uh, show you fake results that would pop up, you know, saying you're infected with all this crap, pay us now and we'll remove it. And so you pay them and it just updates their little visual basic program to say you aren't infected anymore. But that one wasn't that bad. That was actually when I first learned about malware bytes, because malware bytes was the only thing to touch it. Now that I say that, maybe I'll get my crap, you know, infected with ransomware, and I can say that is the uh, 
the worst infection. But for now, there's only the two. I mean, ransomware is only bad if you don't take frequent backups. This is true. I do have a, a cloud backup program that's constantly running and grabbing changed files. So whatever happens, I'm not too too worried. I mean, you should also test your backups. Oh, I have. I have. I have uh, completely formatted and just brought everything back over from it. And while slow, you know, it takes a couple of days to transfer over two terabytes worth of crap from their uh, program, but it did work. So I was impressed. Sweet. Sweet. I guess I guess we're good here. Uh, All right. So it's seven forty one. Yeah. So I guess that concludes our Dan off one talk. So uh, Dan, uh, one more time, thank you so much for taking the time to come here and do a little presentation AMA. It means a lot to us. You know, we're a cybersecurity club. You know, things like this very very exciting for us. So thanks everybody for coming. And uh, yeah, you know, claps in the chat. Thanks for having me. Clap in the chat. Yeah, cybersecurity group. I'm sorry, I'm a normie. I said, uh, what did I say? I forgot what I said. But yeah, uh, thanks again, Dan, and uh, we'll see you around. And he'll, you'll still be in this chat, right? So if anybody has yeah, any questions, absolutely. feel free to ping him. You know, no guarantees on probably when you answer, but just whatever. And uh, yeah, that'll be it. So good luck on everybody's midterms, and uh, see you guys around. Yeah, good luck. Don't study too hard now. <laughs> okay. See you later, everybody.